12, and uh, or 2 Chronicles 12, I'm sorry. And uh, we're going to be looking at responding to the unrest that we see around us in our nation. And really, uh, what is going on with that? And how do we respond to what we see? Because what we see is pretty concerning, isn't it? In some cases, it's just downright angering and frustrating. And in other cases, it's perplexing. And so we want to take a look at that today. And as we do that, I wanted to relate to you a story from our vacation last summer. Um, we went out west, and uh, we went all over the west. In, in nine days, we took in almost everything you can take in out west. And so as a result, um, I was using my GPS all the time. I, I relied entirely on my GPS. And as we got into the trip and we got into some places, we, we went to some places that are not normal tourist places. And we stayed in some of these um, uh, what do they call them, uh, the online bed and breakfast. And so we stayed in one that was way out in the middle of South Dakota, and it was on a dirt road, okay? That's how far out it was. And as we got up the next morning to leave, and I punched in where I wanted to go to the GPS, I noticed something really funny, and that is this. You know how you can program the voice of your GPS? Well, I have mine to an Australian woman because I just think that accent sounds really cool. Well, when we got up and started to drive that next morning, it was a man. And I was like, what in the world? I didn't change that overnight. So we're driving, and it tells me to go left. Well, left, there is a cornfield. And this guy says, turn left in 200 feet. Well, turn left, I'm going to end up out in the middle of a cornfield with a bunch of pheasants. And so I just kept going where I knew that we had come from the night before. And then we ran into the highway. And I got on the highway because I knew I was going west. And all of a sudden, the voice changed. It became my Australian woman again. And I, it took me a while to figure this out. It took me a few days to figure this out. But the problem was, when my GPS didn't know where it was, it was the man. And then once it figured out where it was, it was the woman. Now, I say that not to say that women are better at directions, but to say this. When you don't know where you are, you need to listen for which voice you're hearing. You need to be very careful in disconcerting times to listen to the right voice. Because that man would have had me out in a cornfield. But that lady knew where I was, knew where I wanted to go, and knew how to get there. And so today, as we look at this, we're going to look at that. So first thing for a GPS is it has to know where you are, right? Where have you come from? Where are you going to? The GPS has to know your location. And so as we do that, I want to take a look at where we came from as a country. Where we came from was this. In the historical memoir of New Plymouth Colony, published by Francis Bailey's, it says this, When James I came to the throne of England, the Puritans experienced all the terrors of persecution. Some were imprisoned, and all were harassed by oppressive laws, and many were compelled to abandon their occupations to confine themselves to their houses. Wearied at last with these continual persecutions, Robinson's church determined to abandon their country and to seek some other in which they might enjoy their worship and their opinions unmolested. Well, why was that? Because by 1603, the Church of England had become a complex ecclesiastical organization. 
consisting of an uneasy partnership of court bishops, prominent politicians, civil lawyers, university heads, all working directly or indirectly on behalf of the monarchy. You see, the Church of England was the official religion of England. The government and the church were seen as one, and the government was the most important part. So departure from any of the stated beliefs of the Church of England was punishable as treason. Could you imagine that? That if you disagreed with the church, you would be tried and hung or killed for treason. Well, that was the situation that the Puritans found themselves in. And that's why they wanted to be Puritans. They wanted to purify the church from the government's influence of secular actions. And so they went to Holland for about 10 years, and then they set out for America. So fast forward to today, and this is still a big issue, isn't it? The government and the church, isn't it? We have the entire movement today of the separation of church and state, don't we? It's used by those who wish to change history to say that our founding fathers wanted to have no religious influence in government, i.e., that secular government was the best government. However, that is patently false. What our forefathers wanted was to be able to worship freely without the Church of England dictating to them what they should believe, meaning that the government should allow them to worship and to practice their beliefs without any harassment or persecution for doing it. And that is what is truly meant by separation of church and state. So where we came from initially is the deep desire of the Puritans to be able to worship God, to do that wholeheartedly and to have no fear of punishment for that worship. Now, did this change when they came to America? Listen to the writings of our first president and those who wrote our Constitution. George Washington said this, It is impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Of all the dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, our religion and morality are the indispensable supporters. Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that our national morality can prevail in the exclusion of religious principle. In other words, without God, there's no reason for morality. And you can't rule right without God. Listen to what Benjamin Franklin said about God. He said, I can see for many reasons that he is a good being. As I should be happy to have so wise, good, and powerful a being my friend, let me consider in what manner I shall make myself most acceptable to him. Wow. Listen to Samuel Adams. He said, Religion and morals are the only solid foundation of public liberty and happiness. Religion in a family is at once its brightest ornament and its best security. In his will, Samuel Adams wrote this, Principally and first of all, I recommend my soul to that almighty being who gave it, and my body I commit to the dust, relying on the merits of Jesus Christ for a pardon of all of my sins. Are you starting to sense a trend here? Where we came from? Patrick Henry said this, Independence Day will be the most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. And his friend, Edward Rutledge, this is a name you don't hear much, but a deep man of God, said this, 
I find that I fully agree with my good friend Patrick Henry when he said it cannot be emphasized too strongly or strongly enough that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, and not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we see that we are truly a Christian nation. We were founded on principles given to us by God in the Bible, and that the unhindered worship of Him was the goal of establishing our country. Today, those who wish to be freed from the prohibition of evil have tried to deny these facts about our country. You'll see why they do that later on. However, as recently as 11 years ago, there is a record of historical Christian foundation of our society in government that was put into the record of our government with House Resolution 397, which was effective May 4th, 2009. Just as recently as then, our congressmen saw the fact that we needed to memorialize and to put in stone where we came from. Listen to these individual statements in that act. It says, whereas political scientists have documented that the most frequently cited source in the political period known as the founding era, era was the Bible. Number two. Whereas the first act of America's first Congress in 1774 was to ask a minister to open with prayer and to lead Congress in reading four chapters of the Bible. Whereas in 1854, the United States House of Representatives declared it, religion, must be considered as the foundation on which the whole structure rests. Christianity, in its general principles, is the great conservative element on which we must rely for the purity and permanence of free institutions. Does it get any clearer than that? President William McKinley declared that our faith teaches us that there's no safer reliance than upon the God of our fathers, who has so singularly favored American people in every national trial and who will not forsake us so long as we obey his commandments and walk humbly in his footsteps. And then finally it says, Whereas President Dwight D. Eisenhower declared, Without God there could be no American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first, the most basic expression of Americanism. Thus, the founding fathers of America saw it, and thus, with God's help, it will continue to be. So there it is. And I, I have to plead with you to understand this, because it is crucially important. The entire foundation of our country, our laws, our society, our order, our freedom, all rest on faith in God. Period. You see, it wasn't our country that came and made it possible to have our faith. It was our faith that caused us to come to this country. And so our country was born out of our faith, not the other way around. That's important to understand because if we do not understand that, we cannot understand the solution to what is going on today. So that is our heritage in a nutshell. So how about today? What's happening today? Well, we've seen unprecedented changes, haven't we? We've seen uncertainty on all levels. We've seen division on all levels. We've seen political infighting the likes of which we have never seen before. We have a Supreme Court that has now embraced abortion and every form of perversion. Now they're going back and taking laws that were made 45 years ago and writing those agendas into that law that are screaming to us today on our streets that were never thought of back then. 
And so all this in the Christian community, as I talk with people and I hear what they're saying, has created one huge question. What should we do? How do we respond to the situation we find ourselves in today? And to do that, we need to go to find that to the source of truth and wisdom. We need to open our Bibles. So turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 1. And we're going to see a society much like our own that had suddenly changed and had left God behind and what happened. It says, Now it came to pass that when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, that he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. That's the one sentence you need to know right off the bat. The king ditched God, and so did the country. Let's see what happens. And it happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, and with people without number who came with him out of Egypt, the Lubim and the Sikkim and the Ethiopians. And he took the fortified cities of Judah, and he came to Jerusalem. Then Shemaiah the prophet came to Rehoboam and to the leaders of Judah who were gathered together in Jerusalem because of Shishak. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore I have also left you in the hand of Shishak. So the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. Now when the Lord saw they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shammai again, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. My wrath shall not be poured out on Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Nevertheless, they will be his servants, that they may distinguish my service from the service of the kingdoms of nations. So Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem, and he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took everything. He also carried away the gold shields which Solomon had made. When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him. In verse 12, I'm sorry, I stopped there in verse 9, and I skipped to verse 12. When he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, so as not to destroy him completely. And things also went well in Judah. So this is the principle that you have been hearing as I read all those quotes. This is what the founding fathers understood. When we depart from God, we depart from what is best for us and that which binds us together. We see that in Proverbs 16:12. It says this, it is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness. For a throne is established by righteousness. You see, it's not laws that make a strong nation. It's righteousness that provides a foundation for order and for freedom. Notice the response that they had to God's word through Shemaiah. What did the king and the country do? What did the leaders do? They humbled themselves and they said, God is righteous. In other words, they said, God is right and we are wrong. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a tough sentence, isn't it? Oh, come on, I can't be the only one in here. How easy is it to admit we're wrong? When I sin, how easy is it for me to say I'm wrong? It's very hard, isn't it? It takes me setting down my pride adopting a humble spirit and saying I was wrong. But that's what they did. And notice the consequences of that. Did punishment still come? Yeah, but it was much less. God still had to have a just response to their rebellion. But also notice in verse 12, when the king humbled himself, things also went well in Judah, didn't they? 
when the leader, Rehoboam, was right with God, things went right with the country. Is that true for us today? Do you think that's still true? Do you think that still operates today? Yes. Why do you think we're seeing the problems we're seeing today? It's because our society is trying to erase God with every possible bit of strength they have. From public buildings to public schools to government, they want, a, they want God off our money. They want God out of the picture because he represents a barrier to them doing what they want, their evil desires and lusts. That is why God and his word have to go. Because if any little bit of God's word survives, you know what that means? They're guilty before God, and they know it. You see, this is the first step, step one, of the process of getting what they want. So what's step two, you ask? Have you heard of the cancel culture? I.e. to change, to rewrite, or to erase the history that you do not like. You tear down statues. You teach politically correct versions of history, which are really fake accounts to mirror your agenda. You deny that God has anything to do with our history. You destroy any monuments or accounts of the truth. Why is this so important? Well, turn over to 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 26 through 28. 1 Kings chapter 12, verses 26 through 28. Here we see why they have to do this, why the cancel culture has to exist. It says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom may return to David. If these people go up to ac offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Therefore, the king asked advice. He made two calves of gold and said to the people, It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. Okay, so here's the situation. I know there's a lot of bones here, so I'm going to explain that. And that is this. King Rehoboam rules the two tribes of Israel. Judah and Benjamin, and he has Jerusalem. He has the capital, okay? King Jeroboam has the other ten tribes. Now, the rule of God was that when you did the festivals, where did you go to worship? Jerusalem. So all the people in those ten tribes under Jeroboam would have to go into Rehoboam's territory. And he says, hey, they're going to have access to him and he's going to have influence on them, so we need to get rid of that. And so look what he does. He goes back to Exodus. He finds a lie, and he says, you know what, Israel? Going to Jerusalem is too far to go. That's hard on you, I know. And so out of mercy and compassion for you, I'm going to set up a couple places you can worship that are nearby so it's not so hard on you. And he sets up the golden calves. Under the guise of being merciful and kind, he says, these are the gods that led you out of Egypt. Now, anybody here who's read Genesis and Exodus? Okay, so is there any possibility that this is true knowing that? No. If you've read it at all, you know that's a complete lie. It is a clear lie. But you see, Jeroboam needs that lie in order to keep God out of the picture. That's why the radical left today is trying to erase our true history. 
so that they can rewrite it and people will believe a lie. And believing in that lie, just like King Jeroboam, it will enable them to have power and to rule those who believe the lie. In order to have that power, they have to take God out of the picture. So step one is to eliminate God from society. Step two is to rewrite history so it gives them power and not God. That's what's going on. That's what's happening in our country today. And from the Bible, we see a picture of it. So, how do we respond to that? What are we supposed to do? Do we become crying Christians and just criticize them all day long? No. When we're facing such huge changes, again, we go to God's Word and we see what He says. Philippians 3, 17 and following says this, Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk, for you have us as a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and tell you now, weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body so that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able to even subdue all things to himself. The first thing that we have to do in response to the situation we're in is, number one, to remember that we are citizens of heaven. We are not first Americans who are Christian. We are Christians who live temporarily in America. Let me say that again. I can't say that strongly enough. We are not first Americans who are Christians. We are Christians who are temporarily residing in America. Because that's not our home. This is not our home. Our home is in heaven where we are citizens with our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. As citizens of heaven, the first thing we must do is to remember who we represent and to make that the primary rule of our actions. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of of God. Regardless of our situation, whether it's good or bad, whether it's peaceful or strife-filled, whether we are slave or whether we are free, the first rule of response is to respond in a manner that is glorifying to God. Secondly, we need to remember the cause of our current state of affairs. It's not because of bad laws, because of bad rulers, because of poor politicians, because of laws that are ignored or ignoring the Constitution. As we saw in 2 Chronicles chapter 12, it's because our nation has turned from God. What we see today is a spiritual problem, not a problem of government. Remember Washington's words, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that our national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. See, we've turned from God, and that's our problem as a nation. 
We can't fix that through elections. We can't fix that through politics. And we sure can't fix it through arguments. Protesting evil simply focuses on the leaves. But what we need to do is get to the root of the problem to fix it. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, we have the one verse that we have heard a lot of lately, and the truth of it is just so evident. It is this, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. See, as we talked about last week, the first thing we have to realize is, is that our country has a heart problem. And our response has to start there. It begins with us when we as Christians humble ourselves, confessing our own sins and turning from them. It always starts with the house of God. And so it starts with us. It starts with us turning from our sins and then seeking God's face. And we do that when we do that the healing process starts to begin. It starts with my personal responsibility before Jesus Christ. You see, if our country was founded on the gospel of Christ, then it will only survive on the gospel of Christ, won't it? And I'm going to say uh, something that's quite pointed, and some of you may be offended with that, and I'm okay with that because I'm not here today to make you feel good. I'm here doing some surgery, okay? And that is this. Statistics say that only 50% of us will share Jesus with another person in the next year. Is God calling you to cast off your fear and to share the good news with someone? Convicting you of silence and reminding you that your faith is not personal for you, but it's professional, meaning it's meant to be professed to others. How many of you know the song, This Little Light of Mine? Come on, come on. How many of you really know it? You all know that song. Do you know what scripture that's based on? What did Jesus say? People don't light a candle and stick it under a basket. But they put it up on a pedestal where it can be seen by everyone in the house. You are a city set on a hill whose light other people should be able to see. Further, the process then grows from personal faith to family faith. And we see this in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem in Nehemiah chapter 3. Listen to these verses as they're talking about who's doing the rebuilding. Next to him was Shalom, the son of Haloesh, the leader of the half the district of Jerusalem. And he and his daughters made repairs. Remember that. Beyond the horse gate, the priests made repairs, each in front of his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Immer, made repairs in front of his own house. And after him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, made repairs. Do you see that? The families were repairing the wall in front of where they lived. And it wasn't just the father. It wasn't just the mother. It was the kids as well, wasn't it? Folks, we need to be sharing our faith, glorifying God in the neighborhoods where we live. Do your neighbors know you're Christians? Do you even know your neighbors? Today, many people don't know their neighbors. So that's why I asked the question. But do they know you're a Christian? Do they know the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you sure about that? Because they need to. And just like in Nehemiah, what we see is God says, I have put you there for a reason. Remember what Jesus said? He said, Father, I do not pray that you will take the disciples out of the world. 
but that you will bear them up in the world, that they may be a witness for you. You are not here today so that you can have a little bit of faith and keep it to yourself. You have to share it. That's what our world needs more than ever. That's what our society needs today is to hear and to understand Jesus Christ, who he is, and what that means. As I conclude our time together, I want to address one last thing, and that is this. This is a statement that people keep saying to me, and uh, it's become frustrating now because I think when they say it, they're missing the point, and that is this. We used to be a free country, and we're no longer free. They complain that freedom no longer exists. And that is both Christians and non-Christians, believers, unbelievers. Please allow me a moment to explain why that's so frustrating. I want you to turn with me to John 8, 31 and 32. John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. As Pastor Craig and I were discussing it, it just became so clear that if we understood this, we would, we would be so much better off because we hear John 8:32 all the time the world loves John 8:32 but they miss John 8:31 then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him if you abide in my word you are my disciples indeed and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free the indianapolis star had that verse on the top of their page of every single page of their newspaper for years. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Does truth make you free? Yes or no? What do you think? No. Truth can't make you free. Read verse 31 with me again. Jesus said to those who believed, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Freedom is not in the laws that allow you to do what you want, because there can never be enough freedom in that. Instead, true freedom comes from a relationship with Christ. It comes from being a disciple of Jesus Christ, from abiding in Him, from being in His Word, from praying, from having that relationship that is to be made free. The great preacher J.C. Philpot said this, To know truth is to be a disciple indeed, and to be made blessedly free, free from error, free from the vile heresies which everywhere abound, free from presumption and self-righteousness, free from the curse and bondage of the law, and the condemnation of a guilty conscience. Free from a slavish fear to the opinion of men and contempt and scorn of the world and worldly professors. Free from following a multitude to do evil. Free from companionship with those who have a name to live but are dead. Free to love the Lord and his dear people. Free to speak well of his name. Free to glorify him with our body and our soul, which are his. Free to a throne of grace and a blood-sprinkled mercy seat. Free to every good word and work. Free to whatever things are good, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report. That's freedom. Think about it for a minute. Have you ever met someone who is truly in love with Jesus Christ? They're the freest people you'll ever know. And that is because of this. They are free from their circumstances, aren't they? If something goes wrong, what do they say? Well, it'll be all right. I've given it to God. And if something goes right, what do they say? Praise the Lord. He's blessed me so much. Has their joy changed in either place? You see, their circumstances don't dictate their situation. 
their relationship with Christ makes them free. And that's real freedom. And that's how we respond to what we're seeing today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time in your word. God, your word makes it so clear. It cuts through all the murk and the, the, the fog of everything that's going on. And Lord, our nation more than ever needs you, God. And our nation more than ever wants to run from you because they have hated the light and they have loved darkness. And they know that if your light exists, they can't have their darkness. And yet, Lord, what do they need most but your light? They need the love of Jesus Christ. They need the grace, the mercy, the hope that that provides. And so, God, as we go forth today, I pray that you will use your word to cut our hearts where they need to be cut. That you will use it to remake us. To do that surgery on us, to make us look more like Christ. That we will take up the responsibility to share him with others. That we will not simply go home and say, my house is very nice, and I'm glad for that. But instead, they will see, and we will see, our homes is not places for us to be comfortable, but a place to invite people to come and experience the love of Jesus Christ, the acceptance that comes in meeting your Creator and knowing Him. And that we may be greater witnesses today than ever, because we are one day closer to eternity. And there are those who don't know you who need to know you. There are those who have no idea what's coming who need to be warned. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll give us hearts to do that. Change us to be better witnesses today. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your love for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we come to the end of our...